Bullshit. It's the No BS Marketing Show. I'm your host, Dave Mastovich. We're with Charlie Schliebs, the Managing Director of Stone Pier Capital Advisors. And we move into part two of our exciting interview. Uh, Charlie, some great stuff in the first episode. Now we're into the second episode. And I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, we talk about marketing at Mass Solutions and how it's about clearly defining your target markets, doing the necessary marketing intel to find out what they want and then developing it or tweaking it if you don't already have it and giving it to them when and where they want it at a price they're willing to pay and then tell them about it again and again. The problem is the vast majority of people often think marketing is that last part, the telling them about it again and again. And they don't do the market intel. They don't do the customer feedback. They don't tweak the product based on what their customers believe. So now that you've heard how we define marketing, think back to what has been your most amazing moment in your experience with marketing, messaging, or communications. What's your biggest marketing success? Well, I've been uh, in large part... Um a professional service provider, whether I was uh, a lawyer or whether I was uh, a venture capitalist and now a, a boutique investment banker. Those are all services as opposed to products. So uh, I guess the, the one I would have to uh, think of um, in particular was after I joined Jones Day, I did not have uh, right out of the box millions and millions of dollars in billings. And if, if you're going to be a partner in a large law firm, it's a good idea to have that. So uh, I noticed that um, um, I, I, went, I had a vacation fairly early on after I was there, and I left this incredibly long list of every single possible way that anybody could contact me. And it was like four pages long. And uh, it was very specific and, and went into detail that no one had ever imagined. <laughs> and, and my wife said to me, you know, I bet some of your clients or potential clients would love to have that level of detail because in the kinds of sensitive things you're doing, securities law or food and drug administration issues with major corporations, there's, the time is a very sensitive issue. And they need to be able to get a hold of you quickly. So I put together something that I had tons of people tell me they'd never seen a lawyer give them before. And that was every single piece of information on how 24-7, how to get a hold of somebody, you know, summer homes, people, other people's businesses, um, fax machines here, fax machines there. I had, a, I, even back in the late 80s, I had one of those really crazy expensive cell phones that cost over $1,000 in the late 80s. They were like a brick. Yeah, but it, I, I had the first one that was small enough you could actually put in your jacket. And so I made myself available literally 24-7 because you have to distinguish yourself. You can't just be high quality. You've got to have something else to distinguish yourself. And I, I had an amazing reaction from both existing clients and new potential clients to the fact that I was willing to give out all that information so easily so that they could be, feel comfortable getting a hold of me. And I, in several cases, um, I got, just because of that, I think, I got new clients that were, you know, over a million dollar a year type clients. So that was, for me, that was a marketing success. Yeah, you understand what, what the customer wanted and what would also differentiate you. You build it and then communicated it. It ties back to that definition. Let's talk about uh, Stone Pier Capital Advisors. Tell me the story. How would you describe it if, you know, the old line is if you're in an elevator or you're in a cocktail party or you're, you meet someone at a networking event, how would you describe it in 30 seconds? We are principally merger and acquisition consultants and advisors providing companies with assistance in buying other companies or selling part of their company or all of their company to others. In addition to that, we do a lot of strategic consulting, things like stockholder redemptions, um, and a lot of help with companies that aren't ready to, to buy or sell other companies and need to be positioned to do that in the future. We'll take them through and get them positioned for that. 
Talk about that last part. Of this. So, so if someone's listening right now and they have a company that maybe was a lifestyle business and they're t- trying to turn it into a growth business and they're getting a little bit bigger and growing a little bit and they haven't even thought about selling, how would you position them? How would you say, let's, these are the steps we take without giving away too much trade secrets. These are steps we well, take to try to get you ready. Every, everyone, is, everyone is different. And we do have people who have very nice, successful lifestyle businesses. And in many cases, we wind up telling them, you know, you're really not oriented towards making those next steps and, and building and growing the company, et, et cetera, in the way that you would need to. And you're probably be- better off just keeping it a lifestyle company. And in other cases, you can tell that the people have the fire and the desire to, to move to those next steps. They just don't know how to do it. And that's where we would get involved in, in analyzing their company, their strengths, their weaknesses, mm-hmm. et cetera, and then figuring out what they need to do. And if there are some skills that go beyond the skills that we have, we'll you know, help them find those, those uh, skills uh, elsewhere. Uh, it's, it's all about moving them down uh, the, the path to, to get where they want to go. So talk a little bit about the other part you said earlier about the buying maybe a portion of a company. So our audience is often, uh, sometimes it's CEOs, sometimes it's entrepreneurs, other times it's middle managers and professionals in large companies. So it can kind of be an educational thing for some people that haven't heard this particular piece. But when you say buying a portion of a company, walk through what that might mean or look like. Well, uh, we have a situation. Uh, okay, I'll give you a great example. Um, uh, let's say we have a client who um, has a successful company. It's got maybe $25 million in sales. Uh, it's profitable. Very much wants to take it to the next level, but uh, doesn't, f- doesn't have the full team to, to, to do that. Doesn't have perhaps all the relationships and contacts to do that. And in going to that next level, doesn't want to sign away every every asset that person has to 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 get the money to do it. So sometimes in that situation, what you'll see is we'll bring in a the type the type of private equity firm that is willing to purchase a minority interest, a non controlling interest uh, in in the company, leaving the individual as as CEO perhaps, if, if that person has the skills to continue doing that. And then the company gets the capital to grow. The, the entrepreneur gets to take some um, money and put it off to the side. So he gets one, the first bite of the apple. He gets, to, he gets some, for his equity, he gets in part some cash to set aside and fund those trusts for the children's college and maybe buy a vacation home and some other things, because up until then, all of that person's assets have been tied up in that company. So gets the new capital, part goes to him, part goes into the company, the company grows, and all things go well, and it often does. X number of years later, that company is doing $250 million in, in revenue. The company's worth a lot more than this fellow ever imagined and is able to sell the entire company at that point in time and made a lot more money than if he or she had just held on to that original business and tried to grow organically, slowly, carefully with internal financing, that sort of thing. So those, that, that's one example. So that example you give, that's in, in your space, is that as common as a venture capital or private equity buying a majority of the company, private or equity, le- or is it less common? Well, first of all, we're not normally dealing with venture capital. That's a whole. That's a different thing. I've done that, but we're not doing that. Uh, and in private equity firms that we're talking about, when you know private equity firm, when you know one private equity firm, that's all you know because they're all very different. Yes. Okay. And and there are some that will only do control transactions where they get close to hundred percent, and clearly much more, more than fifty percent. Then there are others who will do 50-50 type deals and others who will do minority deals. They have different goals, different targets in terms of their return, different methods of operating. Um, the, the ones that will buy the companies, and in some cases they want the owner to stay on, in others they don't. Uh, the ones that are buying a minority position 
They want to make sure that fellow or, or woman is staying and is highly skilled, has to have confidence in it. And part of the art of all of this is knowing who is interested in what and what the fits are because you need to find the right fit for the particular company. Bad fit. Private equity firms that are bad fits with the companies they invest in are always disasters. It's such an interesting and complex type uh, business model, business space, because it's impressive that anyone in that space has to know at least a decent level about almost every kind of industry and every time a type of customer. Well, we, while we, we focus on the energy industry, we, we do other industries as well. And, and historically investment bankers have been generalists, but many do specialize and our one area of specialization is uh, the energy space. And we have a few others that we know a lot about, obviously because of my long background in healthcare and life science, we, we do some work in that area as well, but I, I just lost my passion for that area as we got excited about energy. So we're with Charlie Schliebs, the Managing Director of Stone Pier Capital Advisors on the No BS Marketing Show. I'm your host, Dave Mastovich. Charlie, pick a tool or tip you'd offer that will help our audience tell their story, craft their message, or communicate to internal and external target audiences. Well, one tool that I see people not using very often, uh, and, and that is we all have areas of, of knowledge where, where we've really delved into something and analyzed it from every perspective and really become an expert in it, whatever that is, one, at least one area, almost all of us at least. And what I see is that, that I guess because people are so busy these days, there'll be lots of other things outside of that area well, they'll just accept whatever they hear, and they won't take the time and make the effort to dig into it and, and figure, figure things out. I'll give you an example. Um, I, I was sitting with a good friend of mine who, who just uh, retired from one of the four or five largest companies in Pittsburgh, a senior executive, and he said to me, well, why, why is it that the oil and gas companies won't pay their fair share? I said, well, wh wh where, are you, where are you getting this? He said, well, Governor Wolf says all the time that the oil and gas companies won't pay their fair share. And I said, and you believe that? He said, well, he said, we're the only state that doesn't have a severance tax. I said, do you understand what a severance tax is? Do you know what the impact fee is in Pennsylvania, et cetera? He says, well, no. And so he's just, take, this is what I see happening all the time on, on that issue in particular, because I see that every day. But a lot of other issues, too. People who are really smart people, who have learned one particular area very well, analyzed everything, know everything about it, they don't take that same approach to, to other areas and just make quick assumptions based on what they hear, top line of headlines and articles and whatever. And that, that, that's something I think that everybody needs to focus on. I agree. I teach college classes, and I tell the class throughout the class, the first class and then a couple other times in the last class, is when you have a question or you think you have a question, Google that question because it'll probably educate you and lead to better questions. And I'm not saying don't ask a question. That's, I say ask any question you want, but you, know, you have this phone in your hand while I'm talking. I know you're texting sometimes while I'm teaching and so forth. If you have a question, go ahead, Google that and just see what comes up. And you might have answered half of it and found two other better questions. It's what you're saying. It's like, it, I, don't, I guess it's almost intellectual apathy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, the uh, example I just saw in the newspaper was James Cromwell, the actor who I love. I think he's a great actor. Uh, was at the, demonstrating at the farm show here in Harrisburg. And it, it, with all these big signs about stop fracking entirely and no fracking and that sort of thing. And, and I know... James Cromwell is an environmentalist. Well, guess what? I'm an environmentalist too. And uh, he doesn't have, I'm confident, I know, he must not have any understanding of what goes on in fracking. I'm guessing he's never been on a, on a site, a well, a well site, and he has no idea of what happens if all of a sudden we don't have natural gas any longer and we have to import it, which we were going to have to do up until all the shale gas was discovered with fracking, we were going to have to import natural gas from, at, at incredible prices from Iran and Qatar and places like that. 
I don't think he has a clue. And he obviously doesn't also have a clue about the fact that, yes, you can frack irresponsibly. But guess what? You can also frack very responsibly. It's not an industry where every company is the same. That's another thing I see people assuming all the time, that the whole natural gas industry is monolithic. They're all the same. And they're not. They're night and day different, those companies. They have totally different views and approaches to business and life and ethical standards and um, environmental standards, etc. And so th what, what he ought to be doing is say, hey, as long as we need natural gas, let's make damn sure we do it right. But instead, he and many other people are just out there saying, oh, stop it all together. Well, let's live in a cave, too. Sorry. No, indeed. It's, I often say there are uh, you know, people, know, people know salespeople because we run into salespeople. So we, all, we often have this misperception that salespeople are bad because we run into some bad salespeople. We run into bad customer service. We don't run into too many accountants or chief nursing officers or architects. Most people don't run into all that. But there are bad architects and good architects. There are unethical marketers and ethical marketers. And you're saying the same thing here in energy. And so to just globally make a movie that says fracking is all bad or fracking is all good and just believing that is kind of not wise. And that's, <laughs> you make a very good point, too, because what, what the anti-fracking people say, of course, they'll just, they'll just take the negative spin on everything and they'll, they'll misrepresent a lot of things, frankly. But then the people who are for fracking, they often don't give the right impression either. They don't acknowledge that there are issues that have to be dealt with, that some players in the industry have screwed up, et cetera. And if they would be a little more open about that sometime, I, I think they might be able to bring people uh, towards the middle. Agreed. Agreed. Great tool tip. Uh, so now it's uh, let's move into our pop culture segment. Uh -oh. I'm probably going to be this, bad on this. this is the, no, it's all your own <laughs> perception. And first, it's, it's uh, time to keep calm and hit the bullseye. So I'll ask you to choose between two marketing or messaging classics. You tell me which one you like more and why, and then we go on to the next one. So basically, we'll, we'll go through it, but you have a few seconds to choose. So we're really looking for your first instinct of which one you chose and just your first instinct of why you chose it. Okay. okay. This may not be too entertaining. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> Again, you're, you're, you're modest and humble, Suzanne. Yeah. You can say pass. Yeah, you can say pass if you'd like. Oh no, to. no, I'm and just we'll saying. I'm Suzanne. just saying we'll my answer Suzanne may not be entertaining or interesting. <laughs> okay, the first one and hit the bullseye is Geico's gecko or the Aflac duck. <laughs> I'm a big animal lover, so I, I love ducks. And I had a chameleon when I was little that looks like the gecko, so I'm I'm I like them both equally. I can't. I don't know what to say. And they're both hugely successful. Yes. Uh, Geico has gone kind of off script a little bit more than Aflac, who's stuck with the duck uh, since 2000. Uh, Geico has the caveman. They have three or four different ones, but they do come back to the gecko. Both very successful, both memorable. So it's completely fair to say you okay. take them both. Okay, good. All right. Lexus, the pursuit of perfection, or BMW, the ultimate driving machine. Well, I'm, I'm an automotive enthusiast, and when Lexus started uh, in the United States, uh, it was the only country in the world where those cars were called Lexuses, and they were called Toyotas in every other uh, nation in the world. And so I, I always hated it when the automotive industry would say, okay, in the United States, we, we, we have to treat you differently. You're not capable of understanding a car that we, where we use a name all around the rest of the world. We have to give you a different name. That always bothered me, so I always held that against Lexus. So I am not going to like any Lexus advertising campaign. Sorry. And what about the ultimate driving machine from BMW? What do you think of that one? Uh, the, up until the last couple of years, the BMW 3 Series has been an absolute fantastic driver. That's, they, they've kind of gotten fat the last few years, and it's not quite as ultimate as it used to be. Have you, you, so you've never owned a Lexus. Have you owned a BMW? No, I've had, uh, but I've driven many of them, and I've test driven them. Uh, uh, so, no. So, an automobile enthusiast, let's take 30 seconds on that. Talk about that. How, what, what made you get that way? What all do you do? Anything you want to tell us about being? Oh, goodness. Um, all, all we, you know, I was, the, I was the, the four year old who was identifying every car 
and brand on the street before anybody else, and uh, uh, and have loved not only the the um, uh, the cars themselves, uh, but also studying the industry. Um, I remember asking my father when I was uh, probably seven or eight years old, "How come none of our Jewish friends?" And we had a lot of Jewish friends uh, at the time um, in my neighborhood. How come none of them are driving Fords or Ford products? He said, that's interesting that you would notice that. He said, Henry Ford, the founder of Ford Motor Company, was one of the most notorious anti-Semites in the world and was an inspiration to Adolf Hitler. And so, it, you know, someday people will not focus on that so much. But right now in the 1950s, late 1950s, people are still focusing on that. And you're not going to see many Jewish people buy Ford products. And that was the case. And that's faded since then. But anyway, so I study the industry, and I, and I love interesting cars. And I've had a lot of interesting cars. What's your most interesting car? Um, probably the most interesting car uh, that I ever had was um, an Aston Martin DB5 convertible. Silver gray, black interior, manual transmission. It's a nice car. Wonderful. <laughs> Suzanne, I don't know if you can hear her. She said she almost named her son Aston Martin. We're in the Hit the Bullseye with Charlie Schlieb's American Express. Don't leave home without it. Our MasterCard, priceless. I always thought the American Express ad was great. Don't leave home without it. I mean, that uh, that just sent, uh, I thought, a great message that, that if you were going to travel the world. And when I was with Jones Day, I traveled the world all over. Uh and um, you, you did always want your American Express card with you. You did. And they, they put Carl Malden on those commercials for such a long yes, time. Yes, I loved Carl, Carl Mald, Malden in the streets of San Francisco. <laughs> and he became like the equivalent of Geico's Gecko or the Aflac Duck. He was tied yeah. to American Express. Yeah. Don't leave home without it. Two relatively new ones. One is the uh, stronger one over the last five, seven years, and the other one's the new up-and-comer. So it's Progressive's Flow or Jake from State Farm. Well, they've both been very successful, um, and I certainly are aware of, of those. Now, Jake, unfortunately, he only has uh, one word that he ever says in, in the ads, and that's khakis. Yes. He doesn't say anything else. Yes. Whereas Flo gets a whole spiel on different topics and uh, the most recent one on feminism, which is very, yes. very good. So I'll, I, I'll, I'll, I'll have to probably go with Flo. Okay. Reach out and touch someone, or can you hear me now? Well, I, you know, uh, unless I know someone really well, I don't like to be touched. So, so I'm not, so I, uh, I'm not sure that I really like the reach out. I, the reach out and touch someone never really uh, hit hit me well. So, all right. So we went with "Can you hear me now?" So the second pop culture segment, Charlie, is the sights and sounds of marketing, and it started because every third or fourth blog post of light reading my blog would be a sights and sounds of marketing where i'd pick a song and repurpose it and talk about how that song impacted me from a marketing leadership management communications type standpoint so this episode sights and sounds of marketing starts with the song i can't get no satisfaction from the rolling stones the year 1965 so the sights and sounds will be that song and then talk about that year what were the big hits or misses from an advertising or messaging standpoint in 1965 but the song starts off with i'm watching my tv and a man comes on to tell me how white my shirts can be feature benefit advertising has been around for generations so has our skepticism of it i'm driving in my car and a man comes on the radio he's telling me more and more about some useless information supposed to fire my imagination the old adage, less is more, which in our industry is a big mantra, seems to have been replaced with more, 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 more details, more comparisons, more information to sift through. I can't get no, I can't get no, no satisfaction. That's because we want to decide when, where, and how we learn about things. Nearly 70% of consumers now consult online product reviews or consumer ratings before making a purchase. People turn to Facebook or Twitter to ask friends what they think so they can hear the real story from real people. Hey, 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 that's what I say. Access to feedback is readily available, so what can you do to maximize the opportunity? Ask customers what they think, then listen and tweak 
what you need to change. Also, build your inventory of success stories from what those customers told you. Turn them into testimonials and spread the word through your customers' words. Charlie, your thoughts on the theme of can't get no satisfaction and asking customers what they think, listening, and turning that into your success stories. Well, your last words there about communicating with customers, finding out what they like and don't like, et cetera, is so critical. You know, the, in, in the business that we're in at Stone Pier Capital, uh, our, our best marketing is word of mouth. Uh, if, if one of our clients says great things about us to somebody else in their a peer group, whatever, that, that is better than anything we could ever pay for. Um, or if we, we get referred uh, by a, a law firm to a company and that company gets back to that law firm and says, boy, I'm really glad you referred these guys at Stone Pier uh, to, to us. That, that's what, what we focus on. And it would be, it would be interesting to try to figure out a, a, a tie-in between that kind of concept and, and how to take that ne- up to a, the next level. You don't, you, you don't ever want to rely on people uh, who are you know, ex-lawyers or ex-CPAs like my, my business partner, Dale Kilmeyer. You don't ever want to rely on us to be particularly creative in terms of marketing. We're not, market, we're not marketing advisors. Right. <laughs> but, but we do understand that that, that sort of thing is, is very important. So the other sights and sounds of 1965, I'll take each one, and then you just give me your thoughts on it. So in 1965, this was first introduced. Caution, cigarette smoking may be hazardous to your health. It's introduced as a message from the Surgeon General. Yes, and is it by total coincidence, I actually knew Dr. Luther Terry, who was the Surgeon General. When, who in, who put that? Because when I went to Penn, he was um, – uh, one of the senior administrators at, at the University of Pennsylvania, and I worked with him on a project. So, and he was a, by the way, he was a fantastic guy. He was a really nice person besides being brilliant. So I always gave that particular Surgeon General's warning a lot of credibility. Wow, I, I have to say, I wish I could say I thought I knew that before to the audience, but it was total luck that I picked this song <laughs> and you happen to know the Surgeon General. The first TGI Fridays opened in Manhattan. You know, in 1965, I was not yet going to New York on a regular basis. I was 14 years old. <laughs> so <laughs> that really didn't have a whole lot of impact on, on, on me. Well, this one actually ties to Kansas City in a, in a way that you may know this story, you may not. But Whammo's Super Bowl is introduced and bounces around living rooms everywhere. Do you remember Whammo's I do. Super Bowl? Do you know the story tied to Kansas City? No. Okay, so when they were trying to decide on what to call the championship football game between the AFC and the NFC, the owner of the Chiefs was Lamar Hunt. Yes. His son was playing with a Super Bowl, and he said, Super Bowl. Oh, that's a great story. I did not... That's, I did that's, not know yes, that. Yes. So Whammo <laughs> Super Bowl is tied to the Super Bowl in Kansas City, which is tied to you, and it all is six degrees of Suzanne Mayer. He still wins with Surgeon General. He, he still wins with Surgeon General. That's the best sights and sounds comment ever. The top TV show was Bonanza, followed by Gomer Powell at number two. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody watched Bonanza back then on Sunday night. That was a big deal. Well, golly. <laughs> Gomer Powell, number two. Now, here's here's my favorite one. Joseph Linklater's idea for the intergalactic computer network becomes the first internet. That one I did not know. I was thinking that the the, the DARPA net was the first uh, internet, and so I, I'm not aware of that. Yeah, it's 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 uh, basically I think it was the first uh, t- working towards it, and I just thought the name, the intergalactic computer network, that is good. Uh, you know, made me think of the Beastie Boys and intergalactic. Uh, their song, so uh, that, maybe that's where they got it from. I, don't I, know, I do have one other comment I have to interject here that because you brought up the 1965 song uh, from the Rolling Stones. Uh, one year earlier, 1964, I was 13 years old. I went to my first rock concert, and that was the Beatles. They were on tour through the United States. They came to Kansas City. One of my best friends was desperate to go see them, and um, and. I really wasn't that excited about going to see them, but I, I went with him. And we had the most incredible time because we snuck into the front row seating area. And we were the only guys 
everybody else around us were, were young girls and maybe some parent chaperones. And the girls were doing nothing but screaming, crying, <laughs> and pulling on their hair for the entire concert. And neither one of us watched the Beatles. All we did was stare at all these young girls crying, screaming, and pulling their hair and wondering, what the hell is going on? It was quite an experience. Well, the thing about that is it's amazing because on the one hand, it's great, but on the other hand, there's no other show. Your first show is your greatest show. <laughs> you saw the Beatles in your first show. You can't go any higher. <laughs> you peaked right off the bat. So, Charlie, how can listeners contact you if they'd like to learn more about what you do? Uh, they can uh, email me at uh, charlie.schliebs, S-C-H-L-I-E-B-S, at stonepeercapital.com. Or they can um, reach out and give me a call. They can check our website, and we'd be happy to talk, talk to them. Charlie, this was educational for me and I'm sure our audience, so it was a lot of fun. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me. And to our audience, thanks for joining us for the No Bullshit Marketing Podcast. Visit nobullshitmarketing.biz, B-I-Z, for show notes plus additional marketing and messaging resources. Are you signed up for light reading yet? You'll receive valuable strategies every other week to improve your marketing and transform your message. It really is light, intended to be read in two minutes or less, and it just might trigger bright ideas for you. To sign up, visit masssolutions.biz. Remember, ask yourself, what's the big idea? and build your story around the answer. It's all about bold 